Hi there. Hi, how are you? Hi, Tara. <laughs> nice to meet you. Good. I actually wanted, I was wondering, um, because you, I mean, I know you have this integrated approach between Western medicine and then more of the holistic approach. Like, where are you at with that? Like what, how did that happen? And you know, how much of more of like, uh, ch I don't know, do you, do you integrate Chinese medicine or like what's, what's your approach there? You know, I've, tr I've trained in a whole lot of things at some point, you know, the, you know, Andy Weil is a guy who coined the term integrative medicine, really. Yeah. And so, and, he, um, and because everybody was saying alternative and complementary, when it really was just medicine and, and we want to get <laughs> yeah. past those terms because they're almost pejorative, you know, and so yeah. it's like, no, this is just medicine, actually. And Western medicine is that tiny piece that, you know, thank heaven it's there if all these other things fail, but of course, you know, most Western doctors, it's drugs first, right? You know, and, yeah. and that's what you always try to describe to people is if you walk into a doctor's office, you're asking for a drug, whether you think you do or not, that's actually what you're asking for. Just like, you know, like you were asking about Chinese medicine, you walk into an acupuncturist office, you pretty much are asking for needles. I mean, True. You, you, <laughs> you, you'd be kind of surprised, like no needles today, uh, what's up? You know, and you know, and so it's the uh, right. so same thing I try to get across to people is, is you're, so don't be disappointed in these doctors when, when they give you drugs, because it's all they know. They are prescriptionists yeah. on the most part. And so, so a Western doctor is a prescription now we all know it shouldn't be that way but we, you know we all and we all know we shouldn't you shouldn't um and <laughs> sorry um right. but uh but you know <laughs> it's very clear when you go through I mean, very briefly, my story was that, you know, I went through all my, you know, very intense, uh, you know, you know uh, and that was this junior on his medical program, and I was going to do an MD, PhD, but I really didn't like the PhD program, so I just stuck with the MD, and, um, you know, I did my internal medicine residency, because that's where the smart doctors went, at least that's what I thought, you know, um, and so, uh, um, you know, residency can be pretty tough, you're up, it's, it's a lot of work, I'm just going to say that, you know, and so, mm -hmm. um, and you go through all that, and then it does, if you start practicing medicine, it doesn't take you very long to realize, damn, I don't need enough to really treat these people. <laughs> and I don't think most, that's a, it's a simple aha moment, which is, mm. wow, I really got to learn more stuff than this because you know, actually, if you just read that the drugs we use are dangerous. And so I had, um, it was, uh, very simply, I had this uh, one lady who I, I took on into this new practice that was at the University of California, Irvine. I was an assistant clinical professor there. And it was back when naproxen was a prescription drug. Okay, so now, of course, and when I tell you the story, of course, naproxen's now over the counter, okay, and people can kill themselves all on their own without me. But but I would just continued this medicine, naproxen, for her fibromyalgia condition, um, and she nearly died of a GI bleed. Okay, so, and I felt horrible. Okay. She mm -hmm. lived. Okay. And I felt horrible. But here's the aha moment is when I was in the ICU and I was so distraught, a lot of my, the mentors that knew me came by and said, Gary, you didn't do anything wrong. And I was so mad because I had done everything wrong, you know, and I was more mad at the response from the doctors because I wasn't mm -hmm. worried about legal liability. Everybody else seems to be, uh, that wasn't my issue. I felt like, right. man, I almost killed this woman with a medicine that cannot cure her condition, you know, um, and, uh, and I hadn't done anything wrong based on the Western medical perspective because I was giving the same drug everybody else was, right? And of course, now this drug is available over the counter, <laughs> you know? Crazy. Um, um, and so, and so once you nearly kill someone with the medicine, you should have an aha moment that says, wow, I, I got to come up with something else because yeah. I clearly know that this drug has really nothing to do with the condition I was treating fibromyalgia at the time. So you better understand what you're treating better because what you've been taught doesn't work. And then yeah. at the very same time, Premarin and Prevera was being given to every single woman. So I was taught, I was taught, gyneco you know, menopause was so easy, even a gynecologist can understand it. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's a, a little reference to Doctor, not, doctor not, training. Not, not exactly being that bright is the basic message there. But, um, and basically, because if a woman went to menopause, every single woman got Premarin, right? Every single one. If she had a uterus, she got Prevera. If she didn't, she didn't get Provera. See, even a gynecologist can understand that. Wow. Um, and, and that's how easy. So that's about what I learned about menopause. Okay. It was about that. Okay. Wow. I mean, you know, so, um, and none of that was right. So as so I joke with people and you learn about standard of care, it's like every single time, once you learn standard of care, at least you should know what not to do. 
Yeah. Um, and because wow. when you looked at it, and this is another great understanding, Premarin, as you know, is pregnant Mary urine, right? And then you, mm. that's how it got his name, pregnant mm. Mary urine. So it's conjugated equine estrogens. It's like, why am I giving horse piss to the women in menopause? I mean, it should at least occur to you to think about it, right? Right. Um, <laughs> but she has menopause, let's give her horse piss. Hmm, that's not the first thing <laughs> I thought of, you know? I mean, <laughs> right, right. And so went straight to horse piss, did we? Okay. Um, <laughs> by the way, there's some pretty powerful estrogens in there, which can help with menopausal symptoms, of course. So you look into why am I prescribing that instead of this estradiol and estro estrone and, you know, the woman's estrogens. And the answer is you can't. Um, the answer was, of course, you can't um, um, turn those into a pharmaceutical. You can only use something that else that you can take out out because this was found in nature. And so I'm using horse piss so I can make give some uh, pharmaceutical industry more money. And I'll go, now that's really a bit of a pisser. Um, and why aren't we using natural progesterone? Because again, it's natural. So we got to use a synthetic. And that synthetic had the exact opposite effect in every... So for instance, natural progesterone can literally actually acts as an anti-cancer agent in the breast, okay, where the synthetic progestin that I was prescribing, okay, actually induces breast cancer in, in, in uh, models using the breast tissue. So long before anybody said Premin and Prevera was the right thing, it took me about two months to figure out, damn, I shouldn't be prescribing these things anymore, you know, and then, you know, and that's mm -hmm. kind of that Santa Claus moment when you realize Santa Claus isn't really new. Oh my God, it's the Easter bunny. It's everything, you know? Um, so, <laughs> my whole I, life is alive. My whole life is alive. Exactly. <laughs> so it's, you know, Naperson is wrong and Premier Premier is wrong. It's all wrong. Damn it. You know, it's, it was my, so seriously, it's like that moment my, my brother told me about Santa Claus. Like, right. Seriously, you know, it's like, you, oh my God. It's very too. It's all, you know, and so. <laughs> It's like a faith crisis. It's, it's a similar. Exactly. And I, you would think every single doctor would go through this just by practicing medicine, by the way, you know, and so, but I don't know, it doesn't seem to be that common, actually. Mm. So it takes you, you have this great training in pharmaco pharmacology and pharmacotherapeutics, pathophysiology. So remember, there's a lot of good parts of a medical education, okay, but there's a lot of indoctrination. And so they're all indoctrinated, okay. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and unfortunately, it's like a, you probably find within these uh, nutrition systems, they become belief systems and, and belief system, people who have a belief system can become zealots. Okay. And yeah. so um, zealotry is a problem out there everywhere. Right. Yes. Um, so the Western doctor is a zealot about its, his form, his or hers form of uh, practice. And unfortunately, since they're the most powerful um, uh, uh, model, they kind of poo poo everybody else, which is, you know, uh, kind of typical for marketing, right? You know, you want a bigger business share, you poo poo what everybody else does. Mm -hmm. And so, so it became very clear that, you know, wow, then what, you know, Chinese traditional medicine been around for a few thousand years and, you know, some, some pretty bright people are doing this. I probably should look into that one. So of course I've looked into it. Um, Ayurvedic medicine, uh, I was lucky at the very same time in Orange County, you know, Deepak ran into his trouble with the TM movement and he came into San Diego right at the time I'm having some of these crises. He had written quantum really? healing at that point. Yeah. So, cool. so I went down before he even had the Chopra Center. He had the sharp healing for mind body medicine. I was like in the first classes with him down there. Oh, cool. Um, so I spent a lot of time with Deepak in the, you know, early nineties, basically, you know, and so, uh, and so, you know, of course that shaped a lot of my views about things. I uh, still love Deepak. I haven't spent any time with him in a long time, but you know, we all have teachers in our life that kind of we go through. Yeah. So, so Ayurvedic medicine, I, I hooked, you know, hooked up with some chiropractors and other things and, you know, learned what they were doing. And it was just because I love medicine and, you know, mm -hmm. I just, you know, eventually you kind of looked at, I took Reiki classes, massage therapy classes. Cool. I mean, you nice. know, uh, all the rest of it. I've, you know, had spent a lot of time from shamans to, to, nice. to witches to whatever yeah. else. Okay. So, um, you know, um, <laughs> cool. uh, I, you know, so because everybody's got a little piece of this puzzle, you know, and that's where right. integrative medicine is, is you really got to realize everybody's got some piece of this whole puzzle and, right. and, and you personally have to focus on what you do best. Right. So that's why I tell people, I, you know, I'm not the first one to go to for crystal healing or for, you know, chakra balancing, whatever else, but these people can do that, you know, because that's, you know, not what I'm best at because I should train more at doing that if I say I'm a chakra balancer. Um, yeah. And so, so anyway, so yeah. But, it's just a but what's, 
what's cool is like, you're, you're just expanding the tools in your tool belt. You're just like that way, when this person comes, you're like, you know what, actually, I feel like chakra, you might want to check out chakra balancing because you got a lot of emotional trauma going on. Absolutely. And so I use that term all the time, by the way, it's like, my job as a doctor is to expand your toolbox, okay? Because yeah. you know, if you, I always, if you've never heard of a hammer, they're really cool. You should keep yeah. one around, but you really shouldn't be running around with it until you need it. So put it back when you're done. And so, so all right. these tools, right. and most people have a very limited toolbox, which is exactly the the term I use. You know, yeah. um, yeah. sometimes I accidentally said, you know, to somebody, it's like, like I use this with a circular saw. I love my circular saw, but it can't cause problems. And and it was a new patient. He pulled up his hand, and he was missing two fingers that had been cut off by a circular. Oops. <laughs> I, this is a, I said, you should read your audience a little bit better, huh? And he goes, yes. Yeah. You're like, he goes, hey, case in point. That's what I'm but saying. I did, but I did say, well, that's kind of what I'm talking about, you know? Um, so so yeah. expand your tools, but don't go running around with circular saws too many times, you know, unless you really need them. Um, but that's kind of medicine. We have this circular saw kind of medicine, which is cuts through things, but it can be really dangerous. And so, so me- middle path medicine came out. I was always saying natural medicine says this, Western medicine says this, the truth is always in the middle. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's like, so I, I specialize in keto. I'll throw this an example. Like I, I specialize in keto, but there's been many times where somebody's experienced with keto. I'm like, wow. Like she developed like a horrible relationship with food because of this. She's like afraid of yes. carbs and like, it oh. didn't go well. And so then I'm like, right. I want a pendulum swing and be like, no, mm-hmm. keto is not the answer. Not the and that's answer. like too Pretty far sick. extreme because then that somebody else, I changed their life. They're like, this is the most amazing thing that I have ever found. Thank you so much. And so that's why it's, it's about what's working and not working. And that's when you have anything from chakra healing to right. beauty force massage to uh, Ayurveda to Western medicine. Now you can really help somebody. Exactly. And so, yes, so I actually, because you do enough preparation because I, you know, because the average primary care doctor doesn't seem to know a damn thing. Sorry, I'm now I'm, I'm, I'm right in alignment with Lil, uh, with L right now, but they seem to refer out everything. Okay. You know, so yeah. you see to a, a local kind of your primary care doctor. It's like, if you have a cold, sure, I'll help you with that. Oh, you, you got, you got the burps. Oh, you should see a gastroenterologist. I was like, come on, you know, can't you do anything, you know? And so, so, right. but you know, that you do have to be careful about, you know, you know, being too confusing because most people, True. they think you're just going to give them Prilosec or something like that. And mm-hmm. they get a little confused when you don't do that because I have the MD behind my, my name, you know? Right. And so, um, so you, it's, uh, for some people, they're already there. Other people, you just have to meet them, you have to know your audience, you have to meet them where they're at, you know? Yeah. And, so, um, and, yeah, and take point. them along, you know? And so, um, you know, many of the people get referred from L. Most of them actually know, you know, Pillion pretty well. Again, I, I saw a lady to last week, and she didn't understand paleo at all. It's like, all right, we gotta dial it back. I thought our conversation was gonna be here. We better start down here, okay? You right. Know? Um, and so, uh, and so, anyways. But uh, it's good to have a lot of tools in the toolbox. Yeah. You know, that's uh, it. That makes your job so much easier as a doctor because you just you're never nervous about what you see because you know enough to treat them at least in some way. You know. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Right. Yeah. I, I love your approach already. Um, right. and how, how did L, how did L find you? Uh, it was something called primal docs or something and, okay. and how they knew about me. I don't know. I, I, some, I'm guessing somebody in my office signed me up for it or something. And, and, yeah. and, uh, and I, and she goes, I found you through primal dogs. And I was like, who are they? Okay. <laughs> and, and, and she says, you're one of them. Okay, cool. Okay. Cause I was recommending, you know, primal and paleo at the time, but I didn't know I was a primal doc per se, but sure enough I was um so anyway she found me through that and she drove up she's from LA and she we met uh kind of in between and we just talked for a while and we hit it off and we've been friends ever since so oh right on okay cool all right let's let's uh let's dive in yeah let's dive into let's dive into the thyroid um because like like it's something like the last 60 pages of Elle's book are from you right correct so, and I know that, yeah, and I'll drop, that's the paleothyroid solution by L. Russ is what we're talking about. And this right. is your, you know, I guess, how does she put it? You do the commentary or you referred on, a, on this book. It's a, a published interview. Yeah. So exactly. Yeah. That's kind of the way I just call it a published interview, you know? Yeah. Okay, cool. So like, I mean, cause in the paleo keto world that I find myself in, there's so many people with thyroid issues and mm-hmm. it is, there's so much confusion. 
so much. Like it's ridiculous. And I, you know, even as a, as a health coach, it's, it's been difficult for me sometimes because I'll look at the, the tests, the labs that somebody's gotten in regards to their thyroid. And I'm like, what, how are you supposed to know anything by that test? So that's my first question is like, if somebody has thyroid issues, like what tests do they absolutely need to have to be able to tell anything and why? Right. Right. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, actually, Elle did a great job of this, you know, she so does. Re, you know going over that part of things. So, yeah. you know, the, 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 I see people still, and this really echoes and reaffirms what she, what her experience is. Because one of the things you bring up with that, that was kind of beautiful, was that the person who lives through this know, could probably knows it better than the doctor sometimes because yeah. they had to figure this out. And, you know, so the standard Western doctor sometimes measures the TSH only. TSH right. is the thyroid stimulating hormone. It's, and it's, again, not even a, a thyroid hormone. It's, it's right. a pituitary hormone that, you know, gives you a gauge of, of the thyroid. It's obviously not a useless test. It has been, it was the very first thyroid test that ever existed. Mm. And so before then you had to diagnose it sort of clinically because there wasn't a blood test. So Yahoo TSH, mm. I mean, you don't want to you know, poo poo it too much because it was the first test available. And then the mm -hmm. T4 came and then this T3 uptake came and then the free T4. And the whole point is back when I started learning about this, I had a 486 computer, which had, was great. I loved that, that, that guy. Um, I have to admit the, the phone we're talking on today is more advanced than that. And so, yeah. so yes, yeah. the TSH was wonderful. Like that computer was wonderful at the time. It was, it was a joy, you know, nothing like what we have today. And so I don't understand why doctors don't continue to order different, more tests. Yeah. And it goes back to like, we were talking about how I think sometimes doctors are taught so simplistically, the TSH is all that matters because we want everybody mainly on, um, being pushed from big pharma to only prescribe Synthroid. And mm -hmm. if you only prescribe Synthroid, supposedly, it's not true. Supposedly, the only thing that matters is the TSH, okay? Mm -hmm. And the TSH has value, okay? It's very important to understand. But the, for any doctor to understand your thyroid, they have to measure the TSH, the free T4. Free just means unbound thyroid hormone. It's the T4. Think of T4 as the reserve hormone. And I always compare it to like money in the bank. It's good to have money in the bank. T4 does very little on its own, but you make T3 from it. So very important to understand T4. T3, free T3 specifically, is the unbound active thyroid hormone. Very important hormone. The, the confusion from the Western doctors and the confusion for the patients to understand why the doctors don't uh, order the hormone is T3 does change more throughout the day. It is not as clearly a steady state value as TSH and free T4. However, it is the most important thyroid hormone, okay? Um, and even though it fluctuates some, that's why you have to understand. Might even have to order it a few more times to get a full understanding, but it doesn't mean not to order it. And then comes the biggie, the the make or break hormone, the reverse T3, which uh, somehow it's like bringing up, I don't know, coronavirus or Vietnam. It's like, it'll cause a war out there or something, you know, it's, it's, it's just a test. I mean, you know, come on folks, let's not get too excited about it. It can change fairly rapidly as two. Reverse T3 is when the T4 gets converted into the metabolically inactive version of T4 known as reverse T3. Um, it is not really an anti-thyroid hormone, but it does block the T3 receptor, keeping T3 from functioning. Okay, So it's a super important hormone because over a course of time, what's happened is that, and I think it's primarily because of stress, because of so many toxins in the environment, the BPAs, the BPS, all the chemicals and fragrances and all those things dramatically affect the ability of this T4 to T3 to occur, conversion to occur intracellularly in the, in the liver, in the kidneys where these things happen, okay? Um, so that the, the free T3 and the reverse T3 now are absolutely by far the most important thyroid tests and the doctors don't measure them, okay? Wow. It's, and it's astounding because you pick up on most of the thyroid dysfunction. And you have to discuss, a doctor won't legitimately think hypothyroid exists unless the TSH is elevating. So everybody who doesn't understand mm -hmm. TSH, the, the pituitary is talking to the thyroid. If it doesn't hear enough thyroid, that it starts to shout, if you will. The TSH goes up. Okay, so when the TSH is elevated, you have hypothyroidism, which means low thyroid. If it really drops down, you are hyperthyroid, meaning excess thyroid. Okay, now caveat to that is it changes once we start prescribing thyroid hormones. So once you start prescribing thyroid hormones, 
the reference ranges, the levels we use all change. Okay, it's really important to understand that too. And that's another thing I don't know why the doctors don't seem to understand. So, um, and this might be a good point to bring up when the doctor prescribes T3, because T3 has a fast half-life in and out of the body in four hours. If you use a sustained release T3 in and out of the body in up maybe eight to 12 hours. So it goes up and down, the peak is higher. The peak T3 will lead to a higher suppression of the TSH, okay? And this is very important for everybody here. If you're prescribing T4 only, okay, the TSH is a very useful test and you don't wanna suppress it too much. However, if you're prescribing T3 because of the fast metabolism, to get adequate thyroid hormone levels, you almost always suppress the TSH, okay? Meaning the TSH right. is gonna be low in almost everybody where you use desiccated thyroid, yeah. immediate release T3, sustained release T3. But in the early screening interval, you'd wanna get those four hormones. And of course, th TPO antibodies, thyroid peroxidase antibodies, thyroid globulin antibodies. Um, I actually am getting to the point where I'm me actually measuring the TSI, the thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin um, antibody, which is the hyperthyroid antibody as mm -hmm. well, because I do see cases of mixed hypo and hyperthyroidism, which is really difficult to treat. Interesting. Okay? And I want to be clear, I've, I've had patients of mine who have this, who've been told by endocrinologists that doesn't exist. And once yeah. again, I have the test to prove that it exists. Okay. Wow. Um, and so they are tough to treat. So I, I, I recommend somebody like me to treat somebody like that. Um, yeah. um, but uh, so if you have something like that, you better see somebody who knows these things. But um, so why do you measure thyroid antibodies? Man, it's such an important thing, everybody. Being autoimmune is not a good thing, okay? Mm. So, so a typical endocrinologist will tell you, well, we, let's say they did measure it once, okay? And you were positive for Hashimoto's, okay? Mm. Um, and so Hashimoto's, Hashimoto is the doctor who named autoimmune thyroid disease based on these antibodies, by the way. So mm. autoimmune thyroiditis and Hashimoto's is primarily used interchangeably, okay? Mm. Um, and so, and they, you, I saw patients seriously just this week. Okay, where she didn't even know that she had Hashimoto's because she didn't quite understand the doctor. Uh, she had the thyroid antibodies, okay, um, but she wasn't hypothyroid yet. So she was told she didn't, the doctor didn't clearly communicate with her, let's put it mm -hmm. this way, okay, where she didn't understand that she really did have Hashimoto's even though she wasn't low thyroid yet. And I went, it's great because you have these thyroid antibodies and if we can get rid of them, you'll never become hypothyroid. So even though we missed about five years from the original labs, we still have a chance to treat her and have her never become hypothyroid. But the, the, the real message that I'm sure the doctor said is, well, you're not hypothyroid yet. We don't measure, need to measure these antibodies. Eventually you'll become hypothyroid. So we'll just measure your tests every year. And when you become hypothyroid, <laughs> we'll, put you on, we'll put you on thyroid hormone. And that was, that I know wow. is what it meant, okay? Um, <sighs> and so, um, and it's like, wow, because <sighs> theory, based in that model, there's no way to treat hypothyroidism. Okay, right. I'm sorry. No way to treat autoimmune thyroid. Yeah. No way to treat Hashimoto's. Therefore, you're just and the the Western mindset was well, they're just going to knock off their thyroid and we'll put them on synthroid and everybody lives happily ever after. And and wow, what a mess up that is! <laughs> it's like let's just yeah. wait for it to break. It's just, exactly. it, it's not broken yet, but it will be. So we'll just wait for that. And having this is, I want everybody to hear this, and I'm not trying to be scary. Thyroid peroxidase antibodies, high autoimmunity associated with higher risk of cardiovascular disease, specifically coronary artery disease. Thyroglobulin antibodies are associated with higher risks of things like breast cancer. So mm. being autoimmune is not a good thing okay mm -hmm. I, I know that should be obvious everybody but um and this kind of goes into western medicine which is the almost all autoimmune diseases are not well understood and mm -hmm. on right. and i'll be very clear with everybody and this is going to sound negative but it's true there's no motivation to cure them there's only motivation to put you on drugs that kind of muck up the inflammation, make you feel a little bit better so we can give you a drug for the rest of your life. So there is very little research into why lupus exists and why rheumatoid arthritis right. exists because that's what we should be looking for, okay? And right. often the answer is in the diet, not always, okay? So be clear, it's confusing to people. The only autoimmune disease we understand is known as celiac disease. Celiac disease is a disease where you, when you eat gluten, the classic gluten, barley, rye, and wheat, um, you, don't, you don't attack gluten. And this is an interesting thing that people don't seem to understand. You're not attacking the gluten. When you eat that, you attack yourself, okay? And here's the beauty. And the only autoimmune disease we understand, if you take away the, the gluten, 
you stop attacking yourself, okay? Meaning you take, because what we're taught is as long as you have this thyroid, you're just going to attack it until it's dead, you know? Right. And that cannot be true based upon our understanding of autoimmune disease. If you take away the trigger, you stop attacking yourself, okay? Mm. So it's really important to try to find that trigger, even though it's not as easy as for celiac disease, which is the only autoimmune disease we understand. Because you take away the gluten, the person no longer has celiac disease. Now, they will always develop celiac disease again if they eat gluten, okay? So, there's, um, so it's such a profound understanding. So when we yeah. talk about the thyroid autoimmune disease, the idea that you don't keep measuring the, the, the antibodies and figuring out you know, what things you're doing to change these antibodies, treating nutritional deficiencies. I recommend primarily paleo diet for this. Paleo and keto fits right into that. But I'll be honest with most, in an MD's practice, getting people to even, because everybody I see, no matter what the autoimmune disease is, um, the ulcerative colitis and the Crohn's for the GI tract, these autoimmune thyroid disease, the people have been told, usually for decades, that diet doesn't matter, okay? So I'm giving them a completely different message that, oh no, it's extraordinarily important. Awesome. But it's, it's like you're fighting the entire known universe though. And yeah. I'm, I'm uh, you know, the Don Quixote and I'm tilting at windmills almost. Totally. Because it's like, Higher institution is working against us. So, um, so because you tell them that, and of course they go out and then they go on to WebMD, who says it's completely meaningless. You know, right, right. Why would they listen to this podunk doctor from Arroyo Grande, California, um, when WebMD says something? <laughs> okay, you know. And so, uh, wow. or, or that my Stanford doctor, uh, Stanford is the big thing out here on the West Coast, folks. Um, you know, you could say Harvard's, but my Stanford doctor is a thing in the area. Didn't say that was important, and that's just because right. they don't understand. It, you know and so right wow so, so you measure these i know i'm going on but you know but the but mm -hmm. these two antibodies tpo and tga in the body is the most important tsi can be important anyways okay thyroid stimulating and immunoglobulin and of course you measure the thyroid functions but this last lady is a great example of someone who has hashimoto's the auto antibodies but her actual thyroid functions were pretty darn good okay mm -hmm. um, she has a lot of other imbalances and reasons to get rid of the antibodies, but she's a, it's almost like a young kid, but she's in her twenties, but she's a young lady. Um, and so, you know, I'm old enough now where 20 year olds seem like they're kids. So yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> but yeah, Cause I have two sons are like, you know, 27 to 28. So, and they're still my kids, you know, right. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Everybody actually I have a two year old home too. Um, but, <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> keep you busy. It does keep me busy. Yeah, exactly. It makes you wonder why should we listen to Gary? He has a two-year-old at home. Um, <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with him? Anyways, um. <laughs> I'm curious. I'm curious. Going back to what you were talking about about you know the comparison to gluten being the trigger for celiac. Like, what are some of the common triggers you found for Hashimoto's? So great. That's exactly where we should head. So, so think of autoimmune disease as a, an imbalance in the body of excess immunity. Okay. So classically we think of autoimmune disease as excess immunity versus the self allergic disease is excess immunity to the environment. Okay. Um, and so there, and and the same thing goes, even things like cancer, which is under immunity versus the self, okay? Mm -hmm. These are all imbalances of immune system function, which means it's a very complicated issue, okay? I just right. want to make sure everybody hears that. <laughs> um, it's just not easy, okay? Now, I love easy, okay? So I want to make sure everybody hears that. Easy is good, okay? Um, and on occasion, you do get people to just eliminate gluten and gluten only, and actually their thyroid antibodies are eliminated. It does happen. And now I'm very, very convinced that that's not true for everybody because in this autoimmune disease, there's different triggers in different people, okay? And so, for instance, the lady that I was just talking about with the thyroid antibodies, not yet hypothyroid, it was a very stressful time in her life and poof, she became, she developed a swelling in her thyroid and they measured these tests and sure enough, she had acute thyroiditis. I'm sure she actually developed a, a acute Hashimoto's thyroiditis five years ago. Okay, um, under a very stressful time in her life, and I think stress mm -hmm. was the primary precipitant. Actually, okay, I have found um, huge correlations just in working with people on that. And absolutely, so is stress one of the triggers and one of the things that keeps it going on unequivocally? Everybody, okay, um, and so now um, then we 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 institute, and as most people know, there's autoimmune protocol diets. There's many many types of systems out there, but the 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 reason I like paleo slash primal so much is uh, glutens and starchy legumes absolutely are 
two of the most prominent triggers for autoimmune thyroid disease. I actually think about two thirds of people with Hashimoto's have an issue with those, with, with something, one of those things, okay? And so the first thing I tell people is please do a paleo diet. The vast majority of the times, I think the trigger really is a grain of some kind, okay? And so, and I have had patients in my practice where it's been gluten, I've had it be quinoa. And I've had to be anywhere wow. in between. And wow. so I've had to be corn. I've had to be oats. So, and how did I know that? Because I've had been doing this long enough where there's always somebody who, just like the guy with the quinoa, he wouldn't give up quinoa. Now who won't give up quinoa? I mean, seriously. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so for years, he has thyroid antibodies in the 3000s, okay? And, and he won't give up quinoa. I said, you know, it's the last one. Let's try that, you know? And so yeah. years, okay? And wow. he would do it for, he did it for one month and boom, he was down to 300. Okay. Wow. One month. Okay. After Crazy. years and years and years. And of course he continued off of it and they, they went away. And so now wow. do I think quinoa is the primary cause of Hashimoto's? Of course I don't. Okay. <laughs> I just think it, I, it's unequivocally the trigger in him and there's wow. people somehow are still attached to oatmeal and they'll give up everything but oatmeal. And of course their thyroid antibodies are staying high and you go, and as you know, it's pretty true. Whenever somebody won't give up something like, you know, quinoa, it's the problem. Okay. It's like, yeah. You know, I can't give up that guy. Yeah, he's probably not good for you, you know. <laughs> Seriously. You know, you know and, and so so it, it's been oatmeal, okay, or, or oats in general, I should say, you know. Um, yeah, so wow. now, of course, there's people where we go through it and they really do stick with it. And the trigger must be something other than the, the things within the paleo realm. And we often talk about moving on towards autoimmune protocol diets or keto diets and things and seeing if they have some metabolic improvements from there as well too mm -hmm. but there's a big four for treating Hashimoto's number one paleo paleo slash primal lifestyle okay um and so number two is correcting vitamin d okay um vitamin d especially in today's world of coronaviruses and things like that is i gotta emphasize that the right level for vitamin d in your bloodstream is 70 to 90 whatever level of vitamin d you need to correct to get to that level which is usually five to ten thousand units a day usually along with a synergistic nutrient known as vitamin k2 specifically mk7 usually about 180 micrograms a day um and you get your level up to there why? Because vitamin D isn't a vitamin. It's my number one steroid anti-aging hormone. Okay, number oh, one. Yeah. So, um, and if you correct vitamin D, you can do a lot to help with these things called T regulator cells. The T regulator cells are what help balance this immunity. Where um, the biggest issue, of like what we were talking about with imbalanced immunity, is you know having balanced immunity, not lower immunity, as as you would think with Hashimoto's, right? You want balanced, mm -hmm. and the T regulator. Yeah cells are the primary um, T types of T cells responsible for balancing your immune response. And so the so everybody thinks in terms of immunosuppressant or immunobooster, and it's always about immunomodulation, helping your body right. recognize itself. Okay. Right. Um, so, so vitamin D, even though it's like not a vitamin, a steroid hormone is the best immunomodulator. Okay. Mm. And so because it can help you with whether it's autoimmune disease or in the prevention of cancer because it balances your immune system function. So paleo, vitamin D, um, selenium, selenium, uh, specifically a form known as methyl selenocysteine, um, 200 micrograms twice a day is so important for T4 to T3 conversion. So people who don't have Hashimoto's, the antibodies, they can benefit if they have this metabolic hypothyroidism, the imbalance between reverse T3 and free T3. Selenium is the key nutrient in helping that, okay? Um, so those are really the big three. Uh, many people ask me about this, uh, the, a medicine known as low-dose naltrexone. Have you covered that already in your other uh, podcast? Mm -mm. Low-dose naltrexone is very, very popular in my world. I learned about it in treating cancer. Um, mm -hmm. But low-dose naltrexone is a low-dose <laughs> of a medicine known as naltrexone. So it is a medicine. It's a prescription from doctors. Um, it is very, very useful in the world of cancer treatment, by the way, but it, because it is also a, a, an immunomodulator. And very briefly, it's a medicine you can use as an endorphin booster. These endorphins in your body aren't just feel-good hormones that we associate with exercise, or they actually act as neurotransmitters and other things, um, but they're very important immunomodulators as well. Okay, mm -hmm. so wow. very important for balancing immune function and dropping thyroid autoimmunity. So that's a another tool in the toolbox, so to speak. I usually start with paleo plus D plus selenium, okay, um, and then add in low dose naltrexone if we aren't getting responses. 
does that always work? Of course, nothing always works, people. I, right. You know, you know you get some of these podcasts, and it's like, the, you're the only person who didn't respond to this. No, it's like, it, gosh, yeah. everybody. Up, you know, it's a it's a great thing to try, but no, uh, it's does it work in everybody? Of course not, you know. And so, definitely, um, <laughs> that's so, that's probably one of my biggest qualms in like the health and fitness world. Is I'm like, you do you really work with people one on one? Because you can't make claims like that that are so broad. If you're actually working with people one on one, like you know that the same thing isn't the answer for all human beings. It's so crazy this mentality. Right. Because if you're, you know, if you're writing a, a real legitimate doc, thing of a doctor, you know, like you would be having, you know, you really write about your failures too. And of course it wouldn't sell the book, right? You know, because <laughs> the right. Well, they, like you were, you know, like you were, I recommended this diet to them and they completely freaked out, had a panic attack, uh, went to the hospital <laughs> right. and they, my advice, they're now in uh, the care of a psychiatrist because I've done that to people. Okay. I mean, uh, wasn't my intention but you know we all try to do the best we can but yeah. I, I did I once had did a food allergy uh pa- food sensitivity panel on a lady once and and I'm not kidding she literally went home and had the first panic attack of her life because of course she already had enough stress in her life which I had not clued into that that doing that test was the straw and poof she had a, the first panic attack of her life and see that's the kind of and it's not wrong to do food sensitivity panels people I'm just saying you know right. it can enough stress to be, and we end up, and by the way, I still see this lady. She, she forgave me. Um, <laughs> um, and, and we never used the, 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 the test again. I just, put, it got put in the side. We completely, but we're never using that test again because it was, it was just too much for her to take on, you know? And so yeah. and she's doing much better now. Um, and so, I love, uh, I love that perspective. I think it's so important for people to hear it because, you know, people are like, just tell me what to do. Tell me exactly what to do. Or they want to come to me blind. I've never met them a day in my life. And they're like, tell me exactly how many calories I need. And I just, I'm right. like, dude, I have no baseline yet. Like we got to see, we got to play. Like you'd be shocked. I could work with somebody who's 250 pounds and they can't eat more than 1700 calories a day without gaining weight or I can work with somebody who's 130 pounds and they lose weight on two 2,100 calories. Like there's a lot of factors going into that. So like, it's right. important, I think for people to hear this and understand that like, you got to do some self-experimentation and some practice and some trial and error until you find the right answers for you. Right. Cause yeah. that's why I, you know, even though I've studied so many systems of medicine, it's like, like nobody knows enough to write a book. And I know that's not true. And it's one of my own hangups. Okay. <laughs> Um, but, uh, because you really always, I'm not kidding. You always feel like you need to know more. It's like one of the most humbling aspects about learning is mm-hmm. how overwhelmed you should be at how little, you know, Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but I couldn't, yeah, you know, middle path medicine, come to Dr. Forthman. He doesn't know a thing, which is actually <laughs> true. Um, you know, because which is reality, what makes you so great, by the way, <laughs> yeah. it's true because if you're hungry and open, you can right. learn so much more versus being like, nope, I know exactly what you need. You need horse pee. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, question for you. Yes, go. One more question on, on thyroid function. Like usually, you know, as soon as somebody comes to me with hypothyroidism, I'm like, so like how bad are your gut issues? <laughs> right? Like, and so can you speak on that a little bit with gut issues and what you've experienced with hypothyroidism right. and Hashimoto's? It's a great point because, you know, natural, in, in naturopathic medicine and everybody, I'm an MD. Um, actually, lots of people call me their naturopath, even though I'm not a naturopath. <laughs> uh, they're, um, so um, actually, most of the ER doctors in my area think I'm a naturopath and not an MD because of the way I treat people. Um, <laughs> I think that's a compliment. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so, um, but there's a basic saying in, in natural medicine is you got to sleep, you got to poop. Okay, meaning, and so, meaning if the sleep schedule isn't taken care of and they're not sleeping, they never regenerate. So you got to deal with that. So those are the kinds of questions you should ask of almost anybody, no matter what the problem is. Because most people, and I promise I'll get to the GI tract, but they've been so used to having insomnia, they don't even bring it up with you. And it's right. like one of the problems, okay? But they, you know, that old saying, familiarity breeds contempt. So they don't even bring up that they've had this long tan. So I've, I've never slept. So of course I didn't bring up with you because right. they about it almost you know and so so you have to ask them about what their sleeping patterns are usually and same thing goes with like the constipation thing that's usually a bigger one than diarrhea um but you know i haven't had a bowel movement on my own without an enema for for like 15 years you know yeah that's a problem um and then you know just seriously within the last two weeks i saw a lady who's uh 
um, it was only has a bowel movement every three days. And she went to the GI doctor and said, oh, that's normal for some people. And it's not normal for anybody, okay? You know, and so, um, so please everybody, the gastroenterologists don't understand. Now, it's okay, she was of an, an age that she should have gotten a screening colonoscopy anyways. I do recommend screening colonoscopies after the age of 50, by the way, earlier if you have a family history, et cetera. But the screening colonoscopy is just kind of looking at things and making sure you don't have polyps or mm -hmm. cancer things and almost nothing to do with constipation. And so the gut of poop thing, really means I got to digest actually. Okay. So you really need to know how they do from, 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 you know, a uh, heartburn down to stomach upset, down to gas and bloating, and of course to bowel movements as well too. So, and because if you don't digest, which means you're not um, absorbing the nutrients, you can't make you. Okay. And if you don't detoxify, you're going to get sick. Okay. Yep. So yep. it's really important that, that in the world of people who have autoimmune disease is this leaky gut or increased intestinal permeability syndrome a huge issue unequivocal mm -hmm. yes okay so is the the dreaded SIBO the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth um and so yes you really actually have to start with people um sometimes just healing the gut first because no matter what you try to do because you're trying to get things in through their gastrointestinal tract until you heal the gut yep you don't have a chance, okay? And so there's a classic functional medicine uh, program called the 4-Hour Program. The 4-Hour Program in is just to remove, replace, re-inoculate, repair, okay? Um, and so, and it's just a kind of a nice little thing like the, if you've ever, you're a trainer, so I'm sure everybody's heard the acronym RICE. If you have a sprained ankle, you do rest, ice, compression, elevation, right? So, mm -hmm. and nobody argues you should do all four. I mean, you really. And so, well, when you have a sprained intestine, so to speak, meaning it's not working well okay mm -hmm. you have to think of it the same way because it really never gets to rest there's always fluids coming down it you're eating so you yep. don't really get to rest in intestines so once you've kind of messed things up and that could be an antibiotic it could be a birth control pill um yep. a gentleman i saw uh yesterday okay he's been on um prednisone for seven years straight now for a skin condition okay and lots of stress lots of other things going on and I, and I told him, if you didn't have a leaky gut before this, you got one now. Okay, so, and he went, I really think I had one beforehand. And I go, yeah, based on your history, I think you did too. But, you know, either way, it's 100% certain, should I be tested for leaky gut? And I go, there's 100% certainty that you have that. Let's start treating it right now, okay, you know? Because yeah. um, why order a test if you already know what's going on? Because he has yeah. to. Um, every person who takes chronic non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs even the non -steroids. I'm talking about ibuprofen, the leaves out there, everybody, 100% of people, if you stay on it for more than a week, you've got leaky gut syndrome, period, okay? If you stay on proton pump inhibitors, the Prilosex, Nexiums that are all over the counter, okay, you will have leaky gut syndrome, okay? So, wow. so does that, almost everybody have this increased intestinal permeability? You know, again, leaky gut syndrome doesn't sound very technical, so you can say, you know, increased yeah, or intestinal hyperpermeability, it means the same thing. You don't have to get all fancy about it, okay? A heart attack isn't really a good term, but you know what I mean, you know? So so leaky gut is a good term, okay? It's a, you know, there's a leakage across where the tight junctions should be holding stuff out and out of your body. So that's why when we talk about why is it so important to cut grains out of your diet? And the answer is 100% of people, if they eat like two pieces of bread, you can find endotoxin in their bloodstream everybody. This is college students, okay? Meaning that you will get a leaky gut just from eating the glutens. That's it, okay? Endotoxin. When I was in medical school, if you found endotoxin in the bloodstream, it means they're probably going to die. Now, I want to be clear, that's not true. You can eat two pieces of bread and not die. Um, <laughs> but uh, And you can find much lower levels of endotoxin than you could 30 plus years ago, folks. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm dating myself here, but anyways, and so, um, but but that's why grains are so toxic to the GI tract. That's why we have to get them out of people's diets. And as we talk about it, in, in this world where the pandemic and self quarantining are more people eating comfort foods, including these, the, you know, uh, cookies and whatever. And right. you don't. It, it, there's no reason for guilt or blame or shame, people. It's just you try to get across. Have one really good cookie and we'll count on your GI tract is strong enough to deal with it, okay? Yeah. 
a bag of chips ahoy and it's come on it's not a fear fight you know <laughs> yeah and i love what you i love what you said about let, allowing it to rest too you know that's why i'm such a fan of fasting well i'm kind of fasting for a lot of reasons but to me it's a yes. big giant thank you to your digestive tract it's like you know what i'm gonna be uncomfortable for like a little bit thank right. you for all you do every day all day i'm gonna let you heal and regenerate for just a second Right. And I know you're a fan of fasting, obviously, and I am too, by the way. And so, um, and there's of course prolonged fasts that are more about spiritual practices and times in silence. And there's, yeah. you know, metabolic fasting for helping with the GI tract. Cause how many people do we see? They say, I only feel good when I stop eating, you know? And that means by the way, that they don't have a healthy GI tract, it's, mm. you know? And so, mm. so that's like what she should let them know. And so, yeah. so this for our program, and just one thing I want to get across to people, the first R is to remove. You remove toxins from your diet, and you also remove stress from eating, okay? So most people are eating in front of their TV, in front of news programs, or with their cell phones, and they're in fight or flight mode. Fight or flight mode is the fight or flight response, which means sympathetic, okay? And in sympathetic mode, you're literally taking the blood flow away from your digestive tract, okay, and shuttling it to the muscles and to the brain, which is what the flight or, fight or flight response is supposed to do. So please honor the eating process because what's called the cephalic phase of di digestion, which is the brain phase, cephalic phase, can be responsible for up to 40% of your acid production, 40% of your, um, your uh, pancreatic secretions. Wow. So, so it's a profound part that if you don't allow yourself to go into parasympathetic, you can go into relax just by sitting and blessing your food or saying a prayer. Or, mm -hmm. you know what, candlelight is a wonderful thing because it allows you to go right into parasympathetic as well. Use your dining table for something other than the kids' games, um, <laughs> meaning eat there, sorry. Um, yeah. And honor the process of eating. It's such a powerful thing that if you can take away stress from eating and now allow blood flow to go to your digestive tract, because folks, it's not a fair fight. You have digestive problems already. And then you're going to turn off your digestive tract when you throw food in. I mean, come on. Totally. It's, it's Ask not even, for it. You know? <laughs> yeah. And of course, usually when we're kids, we can get away with anything, right? You know, so, right. oh, 2 a.m., let's have pizza and beer and, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what abuses our GI tract, of course. But, um, you know, and so, uh, but, uh, so yes, when you're talking about this, it's so important for everybody to realize I could have developed some autoimmunity, remember, without guilt, blame, or shame, just a recognition, a responsibility, the ability right. to respond in this moment um, and say, wow, I should really honor this digestive process of mine. And yeah. yes, so, so, and I've had a supplement store for over 20 years now. If somebody comes in and says that supplement changed my life, it's almost always digestive enzymes. Seriously. Really? Okay. Wow. I'm glad to hear uh, that. That's numero that I only have three things my clients take and that's, that's one of them. So I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> the number one thing people will say, because when I have a, a, somebody comes to me and they say, I'm taking enzymes and I'm not sure if they're working. I say they're not <laughs> because the people, you know, I mean, you know, if digestive enzymes work and whether that's brain fog after eating, whether that's, you know, burping, yeah. bloating, you know, heartburn, all the other things that you can get with that, improving your digestive capacity when you put food in makes a lot of sense for a lot of people. Yeah. And once you heal the GI tract, many people go from needing digestive enzymes for every single meal, no matter what they eat, to just when they go out to eat, you know, mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or try to, or, you know, something like that, you know? And so yeah. um, they eventually figure out that they don't need it as much because they've healed their GI tract. And so, so digestive enzymes, I'm a big fan of probiotics and or fermented foods. Okay. And so, mm -hmm. um, and so, and then sometimes you need to do things to repair the GI tract. I use glutamine and aloe vera yeah. and licorice and other things. So go through a healing route for your GI tract. If you Definitely. have any digestive problems and that includes any symptoms. Uh, if you say I eat food and I get tired, I get a brain fog. I get a headache. That's a digestive problem, not a head problem. Right. Yeah. And I mean, it's circling back in still to autoimmunity. I mean, it's, it's estimated that what, like 80% of your immune function starts in your guts, right? right. So I mean, 80% of the lymphatic system is around your GI tract. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it's huge. So. It's everything. Who was it? Hippocrates yeah. said like all disease begins in the gut and like 500 BC or something like that. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah. The Hippocratic physicians. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, happen. we're a little, we're a little behind, you know, it's like, we forgot that for a little bit for a second. Right. It's and, so and central. That part is the standard gastroenterologist of today. And I'm just, this is coming from a, another MD. The gastroenterologists used to be the smartest docs. I mean, they love figuring things out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now it's 
that little practice where all they care about is procedures and endoscopies and things, and everybody gets put on basically either Prilosec for their heartburn, which Prilosec is just a proton pump inhibitor or powerful antacid, or Metamucil for their pooping, um, or maybe Miralax if the Miralax representative has been in. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, you know, it just depends on what drug rep has been in their office. And they get mm -hmm. things that have nothing to do with treating things, and they don't seem to understand anymore that how important digestion is and how to help support digestion, which of course is such a powerful thing, whether you're talking about making your body or detoxifying, it's, it's like so, so important. Um, so yes, that's a huge part in all, almost any medical illness, by the way, okay, and yeah. not just autoimmune disease and not just of course hypothyroidism yeah um, let's but, let's go on to if you don't mind right. like you were talking before we started we were talking about like anxiety and depression in regards to right. the gut you know i had a um it was a guy i was dating actually he was had had gut issues he actually was really really sad he had been you know through a divorce and he was like really really low before he met me and he's over and he's like, Hey, can I have some Tums? And I was like, do you have any Tums? And I was like, Oh no, we don't do Tums. I was like, what, exactly. what's going on? Oh, <laughs> and he's like, yeah. Oh yeah, my stomach. And I, so I started to teach him about, you know, serotonin and being for me formed in the gut and the importance of gut health for mental health. And wow, like what a difference that made for him. But the, the, the teaching is just, Hey, like just put some Tums on that crap, you know, just take the Metamucil, take the, instead of getting at the root of it. So can you speak a little bit on, uh, I mean, I know this isn't like your, probably your major thing, but I know that you know about the relation with mental health and gut health. Can you speak on that right. a little bit? Right. Well, you know, if you look at um, a good reference is David Perlmutter's work. Uh, he yeah. wrote Brain, yeah. Brain Make those kind of go into both of these things. And it is an interesting thing that a neurologist actually admits that the GI tract is important because the neurologists of the world, which is David Perlmutter, they're, yeah. they're kind of the high and mighty doctors in the medical profession. They, they're, they're above the gut, okay? I just, because the brain is above the gut. And they don't even think that for a neurologist to admit that the GI tract plays a role in brain health is profound, everybody. And they, I don't think people get how profound this is. Um, so Because it is not part of the teachings there. The mm -hmm. neurologists are, clean, pristine, uh, those poop things have nothing to do with them, but it really does. And so, and, and so, and it goes into a lot of the, lymph, your, your lymphatic system. And yes, you produce, most people have heard of gut instinct, the second brain that we make is many of the neurotransmitters we associate with the brain in the gut, even more when it comes to serotonin. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so if you don't balance the GI tract, can you help people with their neurotransmitter imbalances in their brain? And the answer is no. Okay. Right. And so, um, so, you know, and this goes into, and it also partly I think is because of this loss of sense of self by people because the world is the last 40 years of greed is good. And some other things have taken people away from authentic self, which is part of the reason why when you talk about silence and fasting is to kind of bring us, uh, I think you talked with Abel James, you did a year without uh, internet uh, yeah. and things like that. I just listened to that one on the, uh, and so, um, and most people aren't willing to do a year without internet. And as you guys pointed out, let, let's start with six hours maybe or something like that, you know, um, yeah. but when you're overloaded with these things. And I think so many people have lost their way. Um, and so, and in terms of tuning into their own bodies, because yep. once again, our symptoms are our teachers, people. I don't want anybody to have constipation, but you don't just reach for a laxative, okay? Right. And say, I've treated it, because that's not the answer. It, sometimes you need a laxative, so everybody understands that if you're really blacked up, sometimes you need some help. That's not the issue. Um, but, you know, and same thing goes, the occasional reaching for Tums. I don't have any in my house either, by the way, but, um, but the occasional reaching for Tums because you, you, you ate the wrong food and you got some symptoms. That I don't care about. It's when you have ongoing symptoms. Chronic, you yeah. And that's why I talk about Western medicine has been, it's so dangerous because it's so successful. Okay, and what I mean by that yeah. is it's so successful at symptom relief and allowing you to ignore your symptoms, okay? And then you have, go from your symptoms warning you of an imbalance and then you don't get it and says well i guess i have to throw you a disease now and you missed the entire message okay yeah. um so so if you have any symptom gastrointestinal or otherwise you're supposed to sit down and tune in and answer yourself now i do like the internet and i do like google to some degree mm -hmm. <laughs> um but but the way to heal yourself is to ask yourself questions and journal a little bit and go into silence because i think more yeah. people they, they know what they need to do. They sometimes just don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah.
getting fat adapted and all these other things. I don't want to have to give up, you know, whatever bagels, you know, and because of an emotional attachment, but if, like, once they let go of it, then it's gone. And then they're, yeah. then they're, then they, they're self-reliant. And then I'm sure you teach this in your coaching is, you know, the, their person is their own best healer or the best person to make a decision about you exercise or how you eat. You give them tools, but eventually they figure this all out. And theoretically, they just shouldn't need you anymore. Okay. That's always yes. my goal. Have them not Definitely. Need you. And so, um, and so, but in terms of I, the anxiety and depression of the world, it's a huge part of just getting people to shut out all the news medias and social medias and all the things we're so overwhelmed neurophysiologically get out into nature go out on walks uh you know see more sunsets and sunrises and yep. there's so much beauty in the world that we're seem to be taken away from and then we settle ourselves that actually settles our gi tract i want to be clear about that too by the way um and so and then do some things that are balancing and whether that's herbal medicine or some homeopathics do some things to get yourself back in balance because when we talk about you know treating the hashimotos remember so many people who come to me through l's book actually they think they're still hypothyroid and they actually have an adrenal issue or an iron issue or an inflammation issue it's they Nobody looked for all the other things. So that's the other thing that happens to a doctor, by the way, is you get caught up in thinking you know what's wrong. And once I, I tell everybody, the biggest mistakes I've made is when I knew what was going on. <laughs> Meaning, yeah. I'm sure I knew what it was. I kept cubbing holding every piece of information somehow into that. Like hypothyroidism, as everybody knows, the symptoms are very vague, including constipation, okay? Right. And so in, in somebody can be constipated, you can correct their hypothyroidism. Guess what? They're still constipated. You know why? Because actually the hypothyroidism really wasn't the reason. It could have been hydration, lack of exercise, other mineral. I mean, we could go on and on about it, but you know, and so, um, so, and of course, correcting hypothyroidism usually helps with constipation. I'm not saying different, but, um, but many people are just constipated for the good old American reason, the standard American diet, right? Yeah. You know, so, uh, so no, they're not overweight because of hypothyroidism. So remember, it's, uh, you know, we, we, we try to cubbyhole every symptom into that. You know, it's like, uh, of course, low morning temperature can be hypothyroidism. But guess what, people? It's not always hypothyroidism. Yeah. I wish it were, I wish my job was that easy, okay? I yeah. mean, yeah. Oh, you have a low morning temperature. Oh, 100% chance you have hypothyroidism. Turns out, folks, that's not true. Um, there's other conditions that can cause it, a whole bunch of them, by the way. Um, but, you know, so, so it's, a, of course, a thing to look at. I'm not saying yeah. don't look at yeah. your, your temperatures and things. So, so, you know, so it's very important for people to, to realize that, um, that the, I think it's primarily the stress factors that are affecting so much about lack of self-awareness because, you know, the, the classic things I tell everybody is, is to, to, you know, it's this awareness during eating. So eat a Big Mac as a meditation, okay? It's, yeah. it's a beautiful thing to just yeah. tell anybody who eats processed things like Big Macs. Is they're still out there. I, I, you know, I don't know but if you know that, but they really are. I have and seen so, the signs. <laughs> out of McDonald's away from all the noise and nonsense and you sit in a quiet room and open that wrapper in front of you and and just let the burger talk to you and you slowly bring it to your mouth and you feel it I mean the bread is 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 stale the lettuce is wilted the sauce is not special that is not identifiable as a meat by anybody any part of your body so hundreds of billions of billions of people served in every single moment there is the message from your food telling you not to eat it isn't that amazing okay That's amazing and I that love what you're for yeah. And I love what you're saying here because what I'm hearing from you is, um, building a relationship with your body and like yes. all of the relationships. I always tell my clients this, I'm like, you want a good relationship with your kids or your spouse or your parents or whoever it is. There has to be mutual respect and honesty mm -hmm. and hearing, like you have to hear it. So when our body's saying, Oh my gosh, I really, really hate it when you eat tons of gluten and you're like, mm -hmm. deal with it. Cause I'm doing it. Like what kind of relationship is that? Right. And how do you get a better relationship? You turn off the phone, you turn off the TV, mm -hmm. there's some silence and you start to talk to each other early on. There's a little uncomfort discomfort there because gosh, I, I don't want to have to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> I've had a hard, um, you know, and so, and, but then when you start to communicate and you, your eyes meet, then you realize, wow, that person's just another reflection of me. And then you start talking. 
you talk with your food too. And that's what I try to get across to people is that your food is talking to you every moment. Somehow hundreds of billions of Big Macs have been served and every single person had all the information necessary to not eat it, but they ate it anyways. I was hungry. I was in a rush. They start using the excuses, right? And we do the same thing in our own relationships. Oh, why don't we communicate better? I'm hungry. I'm in a rush. Um, you know, and yep, I, I've got yep. to watch my favorite TV show or whatever it is, you know, and yep. so, so, so the, the perceived external world, meaning your food supply, creating your perceived internal world, your body, it, it's just this beautiful, magical process that we can just learn to love. And yes, sometimes it means learning to learn, you know, love different foods, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, and so because we grew up, you know, I, when I did a paleo diet with this lady once and she said, life isn't worth living without bagels, you know, and of course I'm sitting there thinking, what a sad statement, you know, and so, um, mm -hmm. but, but you, when somebody says that, you don't take away their bagels, okay? So, so we took out every other source of of grain in their diet and they're diabetic a lot of other issues and weights and things like that and by the way it took about two and a half years and she gave up bagels okay because oh she realized actually that it was a perception that that life wasn't worth living without bagels but she had to come to that on her own and as she cut out all the other you know kind of crap out of her diet the the signal from the bing, the bagel just pinged a little clearer you know mm -hmm. um and so and that's what happens to us everybody is once you go back and you you allow it to just come by you realize that there was a perception of bagels that you were in love with and so yeah. um, so that it's but you have to come to it on your own okay having your doctor or your coach force it out of you just doesn't work okay and so um we can tell you because that's why the example i give the chocolate chip cookies the only value to it is your enjoyment of it. So please eat it in full revelry if that's what you're going to do, okay? Right. Have a really good one. Make it a good one, okay? Yep. Yep. Eat it slowly, savor it, chew it thoroughly. Um, the power of that is the endorphins yep. and the cannabinoids and all the things that are being released from it. To say that it's not good for you actually isn't entirely true, okay? It's not nutritious, okay? Right. <laughs> that, that part I'm not arguing with. It's not right. a good nutrient quality. However, it could be good for you from your satisfaction that comes from it. And if it's just one chocolate chip cookie every few weeks, who cares? I mean, I, you got to trust your GI tract to handle that much of a burden. Okay, as far as I'm concerned, you know, and so, and I'm not saying you have to eat, eat them, just the idea is to do this without any guilt or blame or shame. And yes. too often, um, even I, when I recommend paleo, I, uh, you know, um, I saw this couple once and they had, um, they had this great response to this paleo diet, right? But we're in a movie theater and, and they usually were so happy to see me and, 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 and they were like avoiding me. And I'm like, okay. And, and I ran into them in the, in the bathroom. And it's like, yeah, I just have to say this. We went to Italy and you ruined our vacation. And it was like, wow. Okay. That's giving me a lot of power. Okay. You know, yes. so we couldn't eat the, the pizza. Tree. We couldn't eat the things. And like, it's like, damn dude, you know? And so, <laughs> It's That's covered. amazing. It, it, you know, seriously, it's mm -hmm. a true story. And, you know, and so I, I don't want that kind of power in people's right. life, you know, because <laughs> I don't want to be mad if they see me in the movie theater, you know. Um, but, but you know, in the end, I want to be feel I still see these people and they're really happy that they have a paleo diet, but they know they can lighten up a little bit too. And if you eat the yeah. street yeah. pizza in, in Italy somewhere and it makes you sick, please don't eat it. Okay. I mean, this is common yeah. sense too. Okay. So, and it's your body's way of saying this isn't a good food for you. And whether that was, pizza or blueberries remember if you eat blueberries and you feel badly probably should stay away from those for a while you know and so it's just common sense you know and so i can't wait for my clients to listen to this because I'm, i feel extremely supported right now i'll put it that way and these are all the same things i teach because you know i call it a black friday mentality with food we've all seen those videos on black friday of people all of a sudden there's this perceived scarcity and so what do people do they act crazy and they start throwing things into their cart they don't even need and they run over people in the process and we get like that with food when we can't just enjoy the cookie because oh my gosh i'm not supposed to have this and i'm only going to be able to have this one and i want like five billion of them instead of just being like oh my gosh i'm so enjoying this cookie and i tell my i tell my clients to have a prayer of thanks after they eat as well so you you literally feel more full when you say oh my gosh thank you mm, you feel yes. satisfied exactly <laughs> And, and there is health value. It's like the same chemicals are released when you enjoy good music or appreciate good art, et cetera. Yeah. And that's the other thing you try when we talk a lot of, to people about all senses for healing is there's so many ways to fulfill ourselves that, gosh, I miss ice cream after night. How about going out and going for a walk in nature and you find that you're so satisfied 
all of a sudden you don't need ice cream at, at night. It wasn't mm -hmm. true. So it's, and as you know, it's so important to give people something else to do because otherwise they're sitting at home going, damn it, Dr. Forsman took away my ice cream. I hate right. him. You know? Um, or, or pizza or whatever they think it is yeah. that I took away. I'm not trying to take any away. I'm trying to have them consciously make healthier choices for themselves. Mm -hmm. And they realize how much better they feel when they eventually stop eating the bagels or the ice cream all the time. That's the, the thing, you know? And so, um, and, and as you know, it's so important. So, like, well, how much do you listen to music? And so, and, and, and I always lead off with Sweet Child of Mine, which is one of my favorite songs. So, you know, it basically, because everybody thinks it's only Mozart that's healing. That's just not true. You can, you can heal through Garth Brooks, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Clearly, I'm not a country guy, but anyways. Um, but, uh, so, uh, but, but if you start looking at the, what you're releasing at those times, it's those very same pleasure chemicals that you would have gotten through the cookie, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and then you realize that what I really was missing was some sense of pleasure that, that I wanted at that moment. Um, and then you mm -hmm. find there's so many other ways of doing it through art expression, through appreciation of art. And, and there's so many ways to get what you thought you wanted in that food substance, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and so... Um, and then when you start treating that way, the person finds that they find joy in things and they're seeking that out. And then naturally the craving for the cookie extinguishes itself. Okay. Or the bagel or the yeah. I'm bread. So, I'm so um, aligned with that. I always tell my clients, get busy living, like yeah. quit worrying about food so much, like fuel with what you need and then go live, go live, get out, go rock climb, go adventure, go meet somebody, go put yourself on the line, go skateboard exactly. on your kid's right. skateboard at three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> you know, and if you're creative, go, go paint again, go write poetry again, do these other things. Cause, cause uh, yeah, I usually ask people, what is it you gave up as a kid because you couldn't make a living at it? And, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's like, yeah. I used to love making, you know, clouds into animals go out and do more cloud animals you know yeah. or whatever it is you know it's poetry exactly. it's usually something artistic that kind of got squashed out of you yep. because you could be living at it i'm sure I'm, most of you guys understand this one um and you don't have to make a living at it actually i have a, yeah. a guy in my practice who does make a living playing a guitar and we've been talking about stress and meditation and eventually you know what he does he plays cello for meditation okay he just oh. loses and that's his practice of meditation is he came to it on his own is because he wasn't going to do these other things we were talking about. And the cello is just for him and his wife, not for, not for business. Okay. Cause Amazing. you know, so the artistic expression is such a beautiful way of just settling yourself, satisfying yourself because anybody who's learned in music or in poetry, you just get lost in it. Right. So to speak, right. You're before, you know, you've read through a beautiful, you know, my Angelou or whatever you're reading at the time. And mm -hmm. so, and you didn't need any of that, the food because of the really what people think they get are out getting out of the food is some sense of pleasure. And it's, it's like telling people not to think of peak elephants, telling them not to eat ice cream is just not that great a piece of advice saying, right. Hey, you can fulfill yourself in so many other ways because yeah. we all understand that, you know? And so yeah, most people, yeah. like I said, you know, the, they found in uh, India, what was the best way form of birth control? And the answer was putting TVs in people's homes, right? That was the number one way, not condoms, not birth control pills. It was putting TVs in there. So, so, wow. so you turn off the TV and before you know it, you're looking into each other's eyes and you never know what might happen. And it's going to be more fun than cookies. Okay. So, um, you know, there's a lot of good ways of getting out there, you know? And so uh, when we just tune into life, like you were saying, right. Um, and so, and by the way, when that happens, because kind of going back, we were talking about the GI tract, there's so many things that you'll settle. Your gut, your gut instinct was telling you it was imbalanced because it just wanted something else. And this is where you as a healer realized what I was missing was the connection with my spouse, my connection in nature, et cetera. Yep. And you, you don't overthink it. And that's the other thing is just, you know, it yeah. comes to you, you do it, you know? And so, and then you realize, ah, that's what I was missing. And then Absolutely. you really naturally some of the food things just kind of go away. It really is true. And so, so, true. Uh, so yeah. And so, and this healing the gut thing, but remember lots of people do have significant GI problems and they need help from doctors. Uh, this four hour program is a wonderful thing in terms of a healing technique and getting you to a place where you can really just start healing yourself. And then you find, Hey, I just need some enzymes when I eat certain things and I can do better. I do better when I take probiotics or I don't. Remember, it's not, it's, you can figure these things out because you start tuning into them and you become your own best physician because the basis of Western medicine is to take the locus of control away from you, give it to your doctor and you think, 
doctor, I can't heal without a of this. I've been on call at 3 a.m. as a physician, and the person calls and says they have heartburn. I am not kidding, at 3 a.m., okay? And I said, what happened when you took something like Melanta? And they go, well, I didn't, I didn't want to take it without talking to a doctor. And it's like, I'm pretty pissed, by the way, because you woke me up at 3 a.m. And usually I'm not, I'm pretty abrupt at that time. And it's like, <laughs> take some freaking Melanta and don't call me again until the morning. Um, <laughs> sorry, but, you know, some people, yeah. it's like that, okay? It's like, you know, and uh, yeah, if you, when you're working up 3 a.m., you go straight to Melanta, by the way. You're not going to tell them about natural healing things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, very clear. Go straight to drugs because I want to get back <laughs> It, you kind of hit on something big there though. It's, it's really a level of caring, you know, it takes right. more caring for you to say, mm -hmm. Hey, you know, how are you your know? relationships? Are you connected with nature? Have you explored your talents? Um, you know, it yeah. takes more caring to do that than horse pee pills. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, that's the, the funny thing, which is, you know, we just, um, it, Western medicine is really so simple and like the gentleman I was saying yesterday, that I saw yesterday was on the prednisone. And I go, well, I'm surprised the, the, your Stanford doctor didn't try you on this medicine, then this medicine. Oh, they did already. And, that, and he goes, how did you know that? And he goes, it's not very specialized. It's algorithmic. Okay. You yeah. know, and so, yeah. um, and so we have to go through a long, deep process to help him get off of his medicine. I want to be clear. That's not going to be an easy cure. Okay. And so, mm -hmm. and you don't prednisone, that would be bad. Okay. So, so it's going to be in, and he, there's so much work he's going to have to be willing to do. So is he going to get better? I really sincerely don't know because it's, it's the healing process really is going to be him. And, and yeah. so, and giving, he hadn't thought of before. I mean, that's important too. But, um, but when people think I'm a good doctor, it's just because they listened to some advice, found a new tool, used it. It became their own tool. And eventually I should have no association with that tool anymore. It's just them, you know? And so, yeah. so when yeah. I yoga, I learned yoga, especially after I had hurt my back way, way, way back. And that has nothing to do with why I do yoga every day. It says, because I feel better when I do it. Okay. Right. With back to my yoga teachers from the past and everything else, but they would agree. And they don't need their, to see that teacher anymore. I'm supposed to be just doing my own stuff, you know? And so yeah. find all these things. And that's why you know, so for instance, uh, I'm sure you do this with your clients, having the morning daily routine, I think is yep. such an important thing for people, you know, get up and, you know, and, and it can be your own routine, but some, mm -hmm. some version of meditations and yogas and exercises and setting your intentions for the day, have some time for people. And if you don't do it at all, you can start with 15 minutes of that um, and then 30 minutes and build into it because you can allow your life to, 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 to um, develop your life in such a way where you can take these practices on for yourself. And by the way, this is especially true for women as you guys are so busy taking care of everybody else. Um, and I joke with some people about my meditation classes. It's usually in, almost entirely women. Um, and usually they're racing into my, my parking lot <laughs> to try yeah. to get, because you know, they've been so busy raising the kids and doing the, the, the food and raising the husband and everything else. And then they want to come meditate. And it's like, seriously, it would be like one other thing for them to fail at in their life, you know? Mm -hmm. So I tell them, don't meditate. You need to change your life so you have the time to meditate, you know? And so, mm -hmm. so when we do stress management, the first thing I work with, especially true for women, is the stress unloading thing. Value your life enough where you say, hey, I'm worthy to stop and smell the roses and take time for myself. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I can start with you taking more time with a bath at night or something else like that. And just start with something that you historically like. And then you start building in these things. So stress unloading first, stress relieving, which is exercise second. And then you get into meditative practices, but that's a part of a developed thing in terms of your lifestyle where mm -hmm. you start to honor yourself more and more and more. Okay. And so, mm -hmm. um, you, the, and I really, I'm not kidding about these meditation classes. They're usually overstressed women who know that they're overstressed and they, and adding in a meditation practice that they have no time for is just me. Okay. I just want to be clear about that. It's important. I, I'm a, I've been a meditator for a long, long time, but it's, I've set my life up where I can still do it now. And I, we joke, I have, I have a two-year-old at home. Has it been as successful a meditation practice the last couple of years? And the answer is no, because there's been some schedule changes and some other types of things. I make it a priority, but he's the number one priority right now. Um, and so if he gets up in the morning to the Zev things and I don't get enough sleep, guess what I'm doing in the morning instead of meditating? I'm sleeping. Okay. Right. That's the priority. And what am I doing some mornings is he wakes up early and I'm taking care of him and I'm not meditating because that's the priority. And so, um, you know, 
so so you just you honor yourself in all of these things and mm -hmm. so just the next moment you see if you can meditate the next evening or that yeah. next morning and things so this kindness to ourselves yeah. so and just for your audience is a condition called self-critical perfectionism 99 percent of the people who have it are women okay mm -hmm. i think this goes you know very much into the difference between sex and gender is this you know we're learning more and more that sex is defined at birth in the xx and xy but gender is a completely different mm -hmm. subject so this a whole idea that um, self-critical perfectionism comes on the x chromosome, the two x chromosomes it's not true mm -hmm. it's a acculturation especially towards giving into doing certain things um and the problem with this is self-critical perfectionism associated with high performance at work very good levels of and school and work very poor attitude about themselves mm -hmm. okay you, mm -hmm. you never meet whatever standard and that mental pattern is why meditation is so important because the main stressor for most people in their life themselves totally. you know yeah. um and so and this, once you realize who you are, taking that pressure of, of being perfect anymore, you know, is off of you, you know? And so, yeah. um, and so, because that's, that's a beautiful thing to give to yourself. Okay. And it doesn't mean you don't care about your body and care about your food. It just means right. you have to be so critical of yourself. And that leads to such a level of depression usually, by the way. So that's the thing. Anxiety and depression are much more common in women who have self-critical perfectionism. And so... And they, on some level, they see it works for them because they, they, they get, you know, high rankings at work and they get more pay raises. Um, you know, uh, everybody says, you look beautiful today and all these, uh, they get so many things, but they don't feel good about themselves because it's just a never ending cycle. And that's where you, you start to have to step back and go, wow, I don't feel so good about myself. What's going on? And then you start to balance the doingness in your life with the beingness in your life. And so, um, and you honor yourself to just take more time for you. And that includes some time for exercise and more time for food and food preparation yep. and less time on all the other things we've been talking about. And you find you're so much happier. Um, so and so true. you might not get as many things to done on a to-do list. Yep. And then you realize, wow, those to-do lists, a lot of things on there really weren't that important. Okay. Totally. And I'm not have them, but it just, they, a lot of the things you put on there were just kind of busy things, you know? And so, um, so, so, so many things you can do in terms of healing here, folks, is just make sure you understand that when you see a doctor, they're not necessarily there to support all these things that we're talking about. Um, and many people mm -hmm. go to see the doctor for almost anything. They have a, a bump somewhere and they go see the doctor and they're so nervous and the doctor thinks they have to give you a drug or something to, because right. that's, that's the underlying assumption is you're there for a drug. And I, if you don't leave here without a drug, I'm, I haven't done my job. And so, yeah, exactly. um, so, so most of the times we're, we're seeing in the world today, especially so many people who were going to the emergency room before this pandemic, they never needed to go there. Mm -hmm. So everybody's so worried about higher mortality for some other things. And there is some issues, but uh, most of the people who are going to the ERs, they really didn't need to go there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I hope, I'm hoping this will bring about people more realizing, wow, I can take a lot of care of a lot of things myself, you know, yeah. and not realizing that going to the doctor is, is really when you want a drug or surgery, you should be thinking of seeing the doctor. Okay. Um, but, you know, and if that's not what you're looking for, I probably shouldn't go see my doctor. And then, of course, the argument you're going to make is, well, he's covered under my insurance, he or she. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what a bad ar argument that one is, okay? Because mm -hmm. why would I go see to somebody just because of they're covered by my insurance um, when they're going to give me something I don't want, okay? You know, and so, and then you get to a power play with your doctor. You didn't take the drug they wanted, and then they get mad at you. And so it's a, it's a really tough system out there, folks. Um, and I do hope that, like, this critical time in, in the country, um, people will take on this self-care thing that you're and, – and, and I do tell people this, by the way, with the coaching, which is, of course, we could all exercise without a coach. And then you ask them, and you keep seeing them, are you exercising? No. Are you exercising? No. It's like, well, you know, your process is not working. Okay, you know, yes, you could exercise without a coach. You aren't, so let's go get you one, okay? Yeah, exactly. Could you be paleo without, you know, by going online to figure – you absolutely could. And every time you see them, they're not doing it. Guess what? You need a coach in this area, you know? And so mm -hmm. getting people to help you is a really good thing, but getting nutrition advice comes from nutritionists, really yeah. not dietitians, because they tend to go into some dietary advice that we don't recommend. Okay. Like the standard American diet stuff. Okay. Um, 
to learn about that or get references or go on the Primal Blueprint and find people who do these types of things as well too or check in on your website. Um, but get a coach who can work with you and, and know who you are if you're not exercising. And if you have a, a wonderful exercise routine on your own, awesome. Okay, yeah. you know, but if you're not, then get somebody to help you, right? You know, um, I had this 95 year old guy in my practice and it was funny, he had just gotten a coach and he had had six months of training. He goes, it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. Okay, 95. Okay, now you, you would, um, his two previous wives are past now, so I'm sure they would have argued that, you know, that this wasn't, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, that they were the best <laughs> thing. <laughs> there were a few other things that would have been better than this coaching experience, but according to him, no. Um, so, <laughs> I love it so, so much. So much better. He had so much more energy. And by the way, he's somebody who was naturally an exerciser who just couldn't get, you know, after 95 years, finally needed some help, you know. Yeah. Um, so, um, so it was a beautiful thing, huh? You know, and so, uh, you know, so people... It's, and especially guys sometimes aren't willing to ask for advice. That's another yeah. kind of general eye weaknesses. Uh, um, and so if you need help, it's a, it's the, the essence of humanity is we are social organisms that need help, you know? And so um, right. go out, ask for it, you know? And so absolutely. I, I love so much. I love so much what you're saying as a whole. And I can tell I'm like, I really wish that there could just be a different name. Like I really wish instead of being called a doctor, you could just be called a healer and we could just specify this because truly that's what I'm hearing from you is that you are looking for healing for people, no matter what it takes, whether it's spiritual and yoga or relationships or food or sure, Western medicine, Ayurveda, Chinese medicine, like it doesn't matter. Let's just get the person healed. And I appreciate that so much. I'm wondering, I know you're out in California, but like, how can people, how can people find you? Is it the best way to go through your website? How could they get access to you? Do they have to live locally or fly out? Yeah. Well, you know, things have changed a little bit in the times recently, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm doing more, believe it or not, I'm doing more Zoom meetings. Um, but, nice. But right on. More things with people. Some people come to see me because I still, there's a connection with a physician. Most of my intuition with people, I'm better, so much better in person than yeah. I am since I just, and I know there's, but I don't claim to be a medical intuitive. So I, I just, I just, I get more intuitive insights just when I see people. Okay. Yeah. I prefer the first visit to be with me. Um, by the way, my, my website is www.middlepathmedicine.com. Okay. Um, we see people really all across the world now. I have patients from Korea to Germany to France to Saudi Arabia to, um, and so I think I'm sometimes in some ways better known outside of my area, actually. Yeah. Um, and so, because my area is a little more conservative and my, I'm not necessarily considered so conservative. Um, and so, uh, um, but, uh, so yes. Uh, and so they can reach out to you there and then schedule yes. a zoom they, call from anywhere. Yes. And we can do from anywhere. Right. So we do more where the first, that used to say the first visit had to be in person, but, and all the people I just talked about from those countries did come to see me. Wow. The family, cool. family from Korea. I said, you know, the next time you really don't have to come and through the interpreter, by the way, they said, no, we, we really like the beaches here. So <laughs> right on. Awesome. So, hey, I like it. So, you know, there's some motivated people in the world because when they get, the, and that's a really good case, by the way, of a using um, a non-traditional use of a medicine to get dramatic results. And so, so remember there is a time and a place for medicines, by the way, because yeah. that family really responded to a, a novel use of a medicine. And so, so mm -hmm. it's uh, play a role too. Okay. And so uh, yeah. thyroid, barely talked about desiccated thyroids variations on t4s and t3s and treating hypothyroidism listening to the person not just the lab test We're ordering the right lab test of course but right. um and then looking for all the other things so find a functional medicine doctor who does what i you know what i do locally and or through the, the website there's a lot of information on the website too okay in terms mm -hmm. of like that for the digestive difficulties of the four hour program and how to look at digestion and something different than what your gastroenterologist will tell you, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And, and yes, it really is about the healing thing is to realize everybody realizes, you know, it, it can call me healer, but we're all healers and you were all yeah. supposed to be our yep. own healers. And so right. um, the classic joke about the doctors, we're supposed to sit on the sidelines and tell a few good jokes while you heal yourself. And that's it. Okay. It. And so, so you don't take yourself too seriously because what I was telling you earlier is true. People who think I'm good really just kind of took some advice and healed themselves. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. People I think it. I really just didn't listen to anything and they don't feel any better. And then so, true. um, so, uh, so, uh, so for some people I'm great and for some people I suck, you know? And so mm -hmm. it's just, it's up to them. It's up to it's, them, really. It is up to them. And yeah. So, 
that is so, so powerful. I think for so many people, cause they, they do, they want someone to do it for them. Hey, give me your, you know, Hey, can I have a training plan? And I'm like, mm, yeah, I mean, I could give it to you for free, but I know you're not going to do it. <laughs> so as it really is, it really is up to, to the person I've, you know, I've, I'm very open about plant medicines on my, on my podcast. And I've heard shaman say, um, we've seen people come through and do one session of ayahuasca and change their whole life. And we've seen people do nonstop ayahuasca their entire life and never change. Right. So it is that choice. It's not necessarily just the medicine. It's also the choice of the person to make the hard changes in order to heal themselves. So, um, I think we'll, I think we'll go ahead and close it there guys. So it's middle path medicine. medicine. Yes. Dot middle com. path. Exactly. Thank yes. You. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us today. I know there was so much there for everyone I, to think about. So I so I, appreciate it. And now I know I spun off in different directions. I love I, it. You know, necessarily go where you wanted me to, but you know, Hey, you know, uh, so if you Thank want me back sometime, you're right. Yes. I can actually be focused on occasion, you know. I would love to have you back and talk about cholesterol. We didn't even get to cholesterol. And we start I thought about it with vitamin D. I was like, we gotta go cholesterol with vitamin D, but we'll have to have you back. And I'm sure everyone would love to. So if you have if you have the time, we would love to hear more about that on another episode. I definitely know a lot about that one too. So anyways. All right. Thank you so much.